Well, if you have your Bible, open it to the book of 1 John. We're going to spend a couple more weeks up in this thing. 1 John chapter 1, or, or chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be picking up. Lord, we thank you again just for uh, the opportunity to be here. We pray that as we open your word, as we learn what you have to say to us today, that you would write that into our hearts. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be at work. Uh, show us something we need today. Show us something to lift us up. There is so much out there today in the world to drag us down and be bummed and sad about. But Lord, we can come to you and be glad that you are a good God, that you have our uh, best interests in your heart, that you love us, and uh, that you've you're you're working a plan right now in each one of our lives and we are just ever so thankful for that we thank you in jesus name amen so last week uh for those of you that weren't here we looked at overcoming we looked at what it is to overcome uh we know that jesus overcame the world john 16 33 jesus said i have overcome the world so we know that he overcame the world and he did it on his terms and he did it on according to his definition uh, not the terms and the definition of the world, not the terms and the definition of humanity. We talked about what overcoming looks like, and you know we think of overcoming as being victorious and going out there and getting them and climbing over our enemies. And Jesus came and served people, served the last and the least, loved his enemies. That's kind of what it looks like to overcome the world. Everyone born of God, John then said, overcomes the world too. In the pattern, of Jesus not in the pattern of us and he said there's victory in faith as long as our faith is in the right thing right our faith has to be in the right place for there to be victory in it and he talked about believing in God and that means to trust in to cling to to rely on to know that that God is faithful that God is a sure thing you know if you've ever been out on a you know, I don't like my log crossings over the rivers. If you've ever been out there and had a log crossing over the river, you know that uh, you, you always put a little weight on those first to make sure it's going to hold you before you <laughs> before you jump on out there. And and uh, we can trust and cling to and rely on Jesus. He's a good, solid log crossing for us. And we talked about the rearview mirror and the importance of being able to look behind uh, and see what's already happened. There, there are times we don't feel like we're overcoming. There are times we feel like we're being beaten down, and uh, that's okay because it doesn't depend on how we feel. Our overcoming doesn't depend on our feelings. It depends on Jesus. It depends on Jesus, what he's done, what he is doing, what he's going to do. So when it feels like there's no overcoming now, it's good to look behind, take a look in the rearview mirror, see the victories that have come before, knowing that God is still at work and he's still doing something. And John mentioned that uh, Jesus came by water and blood, and we talked about how that's a mysterious thing that even the Bible commentators and theologians kind of scratch their head with. But we looked at the context of this book that informs what he's talking about. And it's, he's, he's really putting forth the fact that Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time. And there were heresies out there that were saying, no, that didn't happen. John's trying to set those straight. So we're pretty sure he's talking about, about Jesus being fully God and fully man. So we're going to pick it up today. We're going to backtrack and a verse because that's what we've been doing lately. Just get the flow. First uh, John chapter five verse six says, "This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood." And that's where we're like scratching our heads, go what? And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. So there's an importance of witnesses, and he takes this water and blood thing, and then he goes on and runs with it. Hopefully we'll make some sense out of this. It's still a very mysterious passage. That's kind of heady stuff. It's like, what the heck is he talking about? Uh, there's an importance of witnesses. Uh, in a court case, anybody ever served on a jury? I've had that opportunity. It was kind of fun being part of the process, you know, going in there and being part of the decision making and hearing the testimony. There, it's important to have witnesses. The defense and the prosecution both call witnesses to support their case. 
Now, when I was in doing, I, I only got that far once where I got in, saw it all the way through. It was kind of fun. The attorneys didn't seem like they were especially invested in the people. They were just like trying to, you know, chalk one up in the wind, the wind column. And but they're trying, they're calling witnesses, they're making the case, they're calling their witnesses to try and support their case. They want people to testify. And it's an important thing in our justice system that people testify in court, that they come and that just means to tell what they have seen, to tell what they know, to tell their firsthand account of what they saw. Uh, so the jury then can get to the bottom of what happened. Now, if I came up here and said, you guys would not believe it. I was setting up this morning and Bigfoot came walking right through this place. You'd be like, Pastor, well, you've been smoking. You know, what, what you, I, I don't know about you. But now, on the other hand, you know, that's just my account. On the other hand, if we're all sitting here and Bigfoot strolls out of the woods, sits down with his Bible and opens it up to 1 John chapter 5 and studies with us, we're all going to be looking whoa and now we've got like several people that would have seen it right we're all going to have a story and some of us might notice different things about him it's like wow he really does stink like they say on tv that dude smelled bad but i was glad he was here you know i hope he got something out of it uh he was big he had like brown dreadlocks you know people are going to see and notice different things bigfoot uses a you know an iv bible did you know that it's the darndest thing uh so we've got, you know, all these witnesses that we have seen and now would bring a different perspective of what they have seen to the table. Witnesses are important. Deuteronomy 19.15 in the Old Testament, going back to the Old Testament, says one witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So you've got to have more than one to really get a good picture of what's going on. The Bible says there should be more than one witness to convict someone of wrongdoing. John steps in here and he says that there are three witnesses for the right doing of God, that there are these three witnesses there. You know, this book, John's put a lot of emphasis on witnesses too. He, he started out way back in the beginning in chapter one, he said that Jesus was from the beginning, that Jesus was before there were people to see that there was Jesus. Jesus was before there was air to breathe, before there was an earth to walk on, there was Jesus. And when Jesus, John called him the word of life, when Jesus, this word of life, that means the communicated idea, the very communicated idea of God about life. When he came to earth, John was there to see it. Not at the birth, but you know, during the ministry part, John was there to see him. And in verse nine, John says, we accept human testimony but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God. Well, duh, <laughs> right? I'll take the testimony of God. Uh, if God is everything he said he is, if he is good, if he is righteous, holy, truthful, I'm gonna take his testimony. I'm gonna embrace that. I'm gonna take that for myself. I'm gonna take that to the bank. So the spirit testifies with the water and the blood. The Holy Spirit, that indwelling, that teaching, ministering, healing, advocating dimension of God himself testifies. The Holy Spirit testifies. The Spirit testifies with the water and the blood, the full deity and the humanity of Jesus. So this is the full plan of God to connect with his created people, right? To use that that deity and humanity living in the same place at the same time in Jesus, God himself comes and testifies to that. That, that is what, what Jesus says he is. And these three are in agreement, it says. Agreement is a Greek word, heis, which means one. They are of one mind. They are of one perspective. There's no disjointed parts to this as they testify together. There are no second thoughts. There are no inconsistencies in the story. They all testify the same thing about Jesus and are, you know, the whole thing is convicted of conspiring to do a good thing. Verse 10, he goes on. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. And this life 
is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So, to believe in Jesus is to accept this testimony. But to reject the testimony of God is to call God a liar. I don't want to be calling God a liar. God's been pretty trustworthy, pretty true. He's, you know, he's been on point, uh, consistent, true, honest, holy, righteous. I don't want to sit there and call God a liar. I don't want to be that guy. In fact, I don't know if you've ever had somebody accuse you of lying when you were telling the truth. There is little that makes me more indignant than when I know I'm telling the truth and somebody's like, no, you're, you're lying. I'm like, I want to raise up because, you know, truth, truth is truth, man. And don't, you know, don't accuse me of lying when I'm telling the truth. I imagine God gets a little riled up too when people would call him a liar. So to believe in Jesus is to accept this testimony. To reject the testimony of God is to call him a liar. Don't want to go there. And what is the testimony? I'm glad we asked. Because here John spells it out in a moment of welcome and rare simplicity. He's been throwing down some weird, hard stuff, hasn't he? And he, here he comes and he, he like gets to a real simple point. Uh, his you know, ideas, his chow mein is just going here and there and winding and tangling all up. Then he comes to this beautiful simplicity. What is the testimony? God has given us eternal life. I can understand that. I know what that means. He's given us eternal life. And so to have and to believe in Jesus is to have eternal life. And speaking of eternal life, I want to tell you that eternal life starts now. You don't have to wait for that. Eternal life begins now in our life here because we know him. We're connected with him. We're on our way out to eternity with him. And having that, our life here, man, should be dovetailed. It should be connected with that eternal life even now starts now we shouldn't wait until after this life to start enjoying and growing in the life that is to come we should be partaking and enjoying in that eternal life and that concept even even now we should know that what happens in the here and now is not all there is and things won't always be like the way they are now and that can be you know for for better for worse you know that the way things are now when they're good well you know Someday it's not going to be like it is now. It's going to be better. And if things are rough right now, things aren't always going to be like they are now. Things are going to be better. Things are going to be better out in eternal life. But what we do and experience and learn here, I think, matters. Anybody like going to the dentist? Yeah? (sighs) I don't like going to the dentist. I'm not a flosser. I tell myself every time, this is my time. This is my time I become a flosser. But I go to the dentist, and I sit there under the hook of shame and the hook of judgment. I don't know anybody that likes the feeling of that, you know, peeling and chipping plaque off your teeth. It's no fun. And there are times I'm sitting there, and I'm like, man, this is horrible. I don't like this. I want out of here. And, man, my only hope is that it's not always going to be like this. This dentist chair isn't my destiny. It's not where I stay. I just got to put up with this, man, for, you know, like 30 minutes, and I'll be out. I'll be in my car driving down the road. It'll be done for another six months. Praise God. It'll be done for another six months. So the way it is in the chair isn't the way it's always going to be. The way it is in this life isn't the way it's always going to be. We should know that even when things aren't comfortable, even when things aren't good, there's a time coming when things are going to be different. And we should be living in that hope even now in this life. We should know that the experience of this life will matter and count in that life eternal. One of these days I'm going to learn and I'm going to start flossing. I, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to see that through, right? But every time it takes that <coughs> hook of shame that, you know, it's reminding me that that's something I need to do. One of these days I'll get it. The journey is just as important as the destination. You might have heard people say something to that effect. There's a quote, I don't know. But the journey is just as important as the the destination. We, uh, in 2016, we took a trip to Rocky Mountain National Park. And that was our destination, right? But we'd never done anything like this. We rented a car and we drove. We didn't fly in, you know. We, We took the time and we rented this car. We drove out there. And you know, a lot of that trip was wonderful. We discovered and saw things we would not have seen or noticed from the air if we were flying in. There are things that we 
we saw and experienced that are part of the story now. And getting there was great, but the journey was just as good as getting to the destination. We, we saw Ely, Nevada. It was a cool little town. Yeah. Not much, but it's a cool little place, you know. We, we saw Ely, Nevada. We saw uh, Great Basin National Park, which nobody knows about. So, you know, it's out in the corner, of, like out in Nevada, real close to the border with Utah. You're driving out there, and whoo, there's this, like, independent mountain range that juts up probably nine, ten thousand 10,000 feet over where you're at. And it's like here. You know, you're driving through the desert and the basin and range and old pinyon pines and sagebrush, and then you drive up in there. It looks like being at Kennedy Meadows up there. And, you know, a little part, no, hardly anybody goes there. We went up, we bagged a 13er, you know, a peak up there. Would never have done that had we flown. You know, the, the journey and the places we stopped along the way, the things we saw are part of the story now. They're part of the story of getting to the destination. So I hope we live our lives that way, that the, the journey is part of getting to the destination. There's things we, we know and experience and see and learn along the way that we're going to take with us into that eternity. It all happens for a reason. Chuck Smith once said and he's gone on to be with Jesus now but he said once that his goal and this is a paraphrase his goal in life was to come to a point of walking so closely with Jesus that when he died and went to heaven he'd be there for 20 minutes before he even realized what had happened it'd just be like transitioning to you know what a neat thing to, to make his goal being so close to Jesus here that it's going to be a seamless transition walking into heaven someday Verse 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. So John says, I write this to you who believe in the name. And to believe in the name is to believe in the nature, right? We've, we've studied that. We've been there. To believe in the name is to believe in the nature of Jesus so that you may know you have eternal life. Not to hope, to pray, to wonder, but to know that we have eternal life. Now, there's an element of faith there, of course, because we haven't been there yet, right? We've got to believe it's there. We believe it's there because he's been good so far. He's been truthful. He's truthful now. We can trust him to be truthful in the future. There's an element of faith to that. We could have got to Rocky Mountain National Park and found a sign that said, ha-ha, it's a hoax. There is no Rocky Mountain National Park. Go home. You know? <laughs> but that didn't happen. It was there. We trusted it was there. We trusted that the road we were on was leading us there. Certainly could not see Rocky Mountain National Park from here starting out. But we trusted it was there, that the road would take us there, that it would be there when we got there. So... There's an element of faith, but John writes this so that we would know, so that we would be more confident in that. John doesn't want us living in a state of fear and insecurity. When you believe and you belong to Jesus, that eternal life is never in question. That eternal life does not hang in the balance. It's there. It's a given. We can look in the rearview mirror and we can see that he has been good and true and have confidence that he will continue to be good and true. You know, last week we, we gave the example of, you know, the sun going down as, you know, having faith. It's got a good track record of coming back up. When the sun, you know, and sometime today, if you hang around here, the sun's going to hit that horizon. It's going to get dark. The sun's going to go away. Now, I don't panic when the sun dips below the horizon. Ah, the sun's gone. It's never coming back. It's dark. We're going to go this is, I'm surprised I don't do this because this is my response to a lot of things. We're going to live in darkness forever now because the sun's gone. And start moping around in the dark. You know, I don't do that because the sun's got a pretty good track record of coming back in the morning. You know, it starts getting a little light over the east horizon and gets brighter and brighter. And pretty soon, boop, the sun comes back, you know, up over that horizon and sends its rays out over the land to warm and nourish and be beautiful. It has a good track record of coming back. I don't panic in the darkest part of a moonless night, sitting there thinking the sun's never going to come back. It's got a good track record. I have faith that the sun will come up. I don't panic when the trees lose their leaves in the fall. Oh, 
the trees are dead. They're never coming back. All the leaves have fallen. You know, they, they turn color, they fall off. There's a pretty good track record of the leaves coming back in the spring. Everything coming back up, you know, flowers blooming and trees budding out. Good track record of that. So the sun has a good track record of coming up in the morning. The trees have a good track record of growing new leaves. And God has a track record of being faithful and of being true. And then John talks about the confidence that we have approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, again, that's not a blank check, right? Every time this comes up, i got to tell you that it says right in the Bible, ask and you will receive anything you ask. Jesus is going to do it for you. So, you know, I want to... 5,000 square foot house with hot tub and I want a BMW, I want this and that. It's like, no, 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 no. It's not a blank check. It's that in his will thing is always there. That's the caveat. In his will and in his nature. Uh, my mom used to send me to the store when I got my driver's license. She loved that. Sometimes I'd go two or three times a day. She'd forget, oh, I need this now. Send me with a list and a blank check. You remember checks? Boy, those were the old days, huh? And I had this blank check in a car at the grocery store. It was usually made out to the grocery store, but I could have walked in there with that check. And my mom gave me the check. I am buying every box of ho-hos and ding-dongs that they have, right? But I didn't do that. That's not why I was there. My mom sent me there to get stuff for a reason, and it was good, you know, to get what she asked for because I was going to benefit from that later. She was a great cook. She was going to make dinner, and I was going to benefit from that. You know, plus I might have gotten in trouble had I just shown up with a trunk full of ho-hos in, in her car. Uh, but, you know, you ask and you receive. You ask, and the beautiful thing is that when we ask in his name, we ask in his will. It's not about gratifying the desires of our flesh, not about gratifying our own agenda. When you have an ongoing life and relationship with Jesus, you start... To want what he wants. You know, you, you start to fall in line with him. Your nature becomes his nature. And, and you start looking not at gratifying the desires of your own flesh, but you look at what, you know, how is this going to love God? How is this going to love people? How is this going to be part of that plan to leave the world a better place, to leave it better than we found it, right? So John says something interesting here in all this. I love this. He talks about confidence in approaching God. Now look that up and uh, the Greek word for confidence is parousia and what that means is speaking openly and speaking freely without reservation speaking out fearlessly. I'm like man that's that's kind of a game changer that we can come to God with that kind of free and fearless confidence. You know, in life, you probably don't talk to your boss the same way you talk to your spouse or your best friend. Or if you go on a job interview, you know, usually it's, there's a certain amount of reservation. You're measuring your words. You're thinking about what you say because you don't want to, you know, lose out on that opportunity. So you're very, you're putting on your best, your best words, your best face, your best clothes sitting there at the job interview. You don't walk in saying exactly what you think. Sometimes, you know, you might not get the job. Uh, I think too often we approach God like our boss. Or approach him like we're interviewing. You know, it's like, oh, got to go pray. I'm going to put on my best clothes and my, my best, most proper words and, and, and go and try and, uh, you know, convince God I'm a good guy. Uh, I think too often we do that. Or, you know, the CHP pulls you over. You know, the, the way you speak to them and treat them can make the difference sometimes between a warning and a ticket. You know, it's usually pretty nice to them, hoping they'll just let you off. You know, guy doesn't come up, lean into the window. It's like, gee, officer, you look like you could lose a few pounds. You know, you don't say stuff like that. It's like, how are you today? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, 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 yeah, I know why you pulled me over. I was going too fast. And uh, I'm really sorry. You know, you're like really nice. I don't think we should approach God like the CHP, like a job interview, like our boss. Here's something that people, I think, need to hear sometimes. And people here, people in TV land out there, God's not mad at you, right? God's not mad at you. He's not looking to cancel your subscription to eternal life. 
So I think we can speak to God like immediate family. Speak to God like a close friend. I know when, when we're talking, we talk very freely, my wife and I. You know, that's, that's a very close relationship. And we, we speak very freely to each other. We say things maybe we, we can't or wouldn't say to other people outside of this little circle of us. We are free. We are fearless. We can communicate. And why can't we do that with God? As freely as we communicate, there's still parts of my mind that she can't see into and know. God looks at each one of us. He knows what's going on in our hearts and minds all the time. Why can't we just speak freely with him? Why can't we have that confidence? And then if we speak freely to him, he will answer freely. He will answer according to his will and not our demands. Right? So he will answer. It's Father's Day, and anybody that has raised children, especially daughters, Daddy, can we have a pony? Uh, like, no. No, we can't have a pony. We live in the city. We don't have any place to keep. Please, can we have a pony? You know, it's like it's really not in our best interest. Uh, can I have a motorcycle? That was my thing when I was a kid. I wanted a motorcycle so bad. We lived up here and, you know, Sugar Pine and Miwok, a couple places. And, you know, there's those back roads you can go out to. I wanted... I was out there on my Schwinn Stingray. I wanted a motorcycle to get out there. And my parents, in their infinite wisdom, did not give me a motorcycle at that time. It really would have been a bad thing. Instead, they gave me a 10-speed, which actually ignited a passion. You know, I, I didn't have a car for a while when I was living in Sacramento. I had, a, I had a bike, and that's how I got around. You know, it was fun. I enjoyed it. It was good for me. So sometimes he doesn't give us what we ask for because he's got something better in mind. So we're going to wrap it up there today. Uh, to wrap it up, to put a bow on it, uh, we, we know the testimony of God and that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all agree on Jesus, who he was, who he is, what he came to do, what he's still doing. There are other gods in this world. You know, they, 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 they kind of creep up every now and again and where Jesus should be in our lives and they like settle in there and those other gods what are their, what are their testimonies what are the other gods we have it's you know relationships maybe cars and money and position and power and what are the testimony of these other gods when they replace Jesus on the throne of our life you'll never have enough you need more enough is not enough you'll never be enough Right? Is that the testimony of some of our gods? I think it is. Maybe you're entitled to something. Maybe you're better than somebody else. You know, I think this is a testimony of the gods that we allow to creep up and replace Jesus. We need to get those out. If the testimony of your God is lacking, you either need to know your God better or you need a different God. And, you know, those of us who follow God, if we try and follow him from a distance, we don't know him well, we don't study him, we don't walk with him, talk with him, then we might not have, we might not have that. You know, we might not have that, a sense of that testimony. Maybe we just need to know him better. Maybe if other gods have slipped up into the, where he should be, we need to get those out, get a better God. And then this week, let's consider our prayer life. That was like mind-boggling to me. I'm pretty free and open with God. Uh, you know, sometimes I may not pray as often as I should, or, uh, you know, it's a part of my life that gets neglected when things get busy, and I confess that to you guys right now. Maybe I need to do that more often. I, If I, you know, don't talk to my wife, that doesn't go well, man. We don't know what's going on in each other's minds and heads. There's a communication that, that goes on there. It's important. If I don't talk to my God freely and openly, then... You know, we're just going to be like, he knows my mind and my heart, but I'm just going to be kind of like wandering around, wondering what's going on, wondering what he's thinking. So this week, let's consider our prayer life. Let's, let's think about being confident with him, being at least as honest with him as we are with our, our spouse, our best friend, our dog. I used to tell my dog things when we had him, you know. <laughs> let's be that way with God. Let's be open, honest, transparent, confident, not holding anything back. What is on your mind, speak it out to him. He will listen. Ask him for stuff. He will give you, if he doesn't give you what you ask for, if he doesn't give you what you want, it means he's got something better in mind. 
that's, that's going to be better for you in the long run. Let's, let's be open with them. So, Lord, we thank you uh, just for this passage today. We pray that we would know you, that we've got this testimony about who Jesus is, what Jesus is doing in our lives. The the testimony is that we have eternal life. Lord, help us to enjoy that now, that every dimension of our life now, to know that this doesn't just come to an end and that's it, but that this is part, Lord, of our eternal life, that we're... We're looking out into the horizon for that, for what you have for us in eternity. What we have now matters. What we have now is growing us into that place of eternity. Lord, help us to know that as we go forward today. Help us also to uh, to know that we can approach you freely, that we can have that confidence. We don't have to be scared. We don't have to be uh, like we're going to a job interview. Lord, you are better than our best friend. And we just pray that we would approach you that way, that we would communicate with you freely, openly, and often uh, as we go out into this week. And uh, Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that this brings to us. And we look forward to gathering again next week to uh, to, to move on, Lord, in this, uh, in this chapter. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll do
that note, get on out there. Get on out there and talk to God. <laughs> <laughs>